Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about source citations. Specifically we're talking about crafting a source citation in the facts view of new ancestry. So we're just going to talk really briefly um, about source citations, just a review of some things. I'll, sh I'll walk you through the screens in the New Ancestry on the facts view where you can craft your own source citations, and then we'll just run through a couple of best practices tips that might help you or spark some new ideas in you. So let's go ahead and dive in. First, um, I just want to remind you that uh, I actually did a video probably well, it's been a couple of months ago. The video was called The Basics of a Genealogy Source Citation, where I walk you through just that, the basics of a genealogy source citation. A couple of things that I just want to remind you about from that video. Anytime you attach a record from Ancestry into your online tree, or if you do it through FTM, through Family Tree Maker, it automatically creates those source citations for you. Now, I'll show you in just a minute where you can go to review those, but uh, that is a, an automatic process. What we're going to talk about today is crafting your own source citations for information you locate elsewhere. So I do a lot of my research uh, online through Ancestry with more than 16 billion records online. Um, I never run out of records. <laughs> There's always something new to find or to discover. But if I'm working on proving something about a particular person, the genealogical proof standard states that I should be doing a reasonably exhaustive search, which means that sometimes I have to go elsewhere for records. Sometimes, because it's all that the state or archive has provided, Ancestry only has an index of a particular record, and so I have to actually write away to the state or get on their website and order a copy of the original marriage certificate or the original death certificate uh, because they haven't allowed those to be placed online. A lot of times I do a, a lot of newspaper research, and so I use the newspapers on Ancestry. I also use the newspapers on newspapers.com. Um, there are free sites like Fulton History, uh, lots of different places where I go for my newspaper research. I will clip copies of those newspapers and want to upload those to my tree. So I've got original documents that I get in the mail that I have to scan and, and upload. I've got things I find other places online that I want to clip. Um, and, and upload that image to the tree. And so I have to be able to craft my own source citations for that information that I have located elsewhere. So on Ancestry, when you're in a person's profile, uh, and hopefully you're on the Facts tab, that's where you should be doing uh, all of your research. The Life Story tab is just a presentation, um, shareable kind of a feature. It's also a great way to look at your family tree in a different light to see where some of your own data entry errors might be, or where you might have um, missed following some of the genealogical standards, or where you might not have made some of the edits that need to be made. Um, or in my case, I just make silly mistakes sometimes. Um, and so I like the Life Story View because it helps to see my tree in, an, in a new way, and it allows me to catch some of those errors I might not have caught otherwise. The Facts View on the new Ancestry experience is much like the timeline in the old Ancestry experience. It's where you have um, your facts and your sources and your family members. And we've put those sources front and center. And we did that really intentionally because sources are uh, what determines the accuracy or helps, helps validate the accuracy of your tree. If you've watched my series on the genealogical proof standard, you know how critical that is. And so we put that right front and center so that everybody can see uh, when they're looking at your tree, if it is sourced or not right away. It also helps you to know right away what you have or what you don't have. Now, the sources at the top of that source column are the sources from Ancestry. So those are the records on Ancestry that you have added. And if you remember um, from, I think, the last video I did about the new Ancestry experience, if you click once on any one of these sources, it will highlight the facts in the, the left-hand facts column that are supported by that single piece of evidence. Conversely, if you click on any fact in the left-hand side in that facts column, it will highlight the sources that support 
that specific fact. We'll talk more about that concept a little bit um, later in the month about attaching records and, and making sure that those facts and sources all line up. Today what we're talking specifically about is how we can add a source. So anytime you find a record outside of Ancestry, this is what you're going to want to do. And there are actually two places you can do it. We wanted to make it really obvious. You can add a source down here at the bottom of the column. But sometimes this column gets really, really long. You end up with, you know, hopefully 10, 20, 30 records attached to a person. Remember, reasonably exhaustive search means we've consulted a lot of documents before we come to some conclusions about these individuals. And so we also have placed a way to add that source at the top of that column. So a link at the top, a link at the bottom. You're going to want to go ahead and click that. And here's the screen it's going to bring up. And there's actually a couple of different parts to creating a source citation. The first part is you need to define the source. Now the easiest way to define the source that I've heard used, and I'm going to reference Elizabeth Schoen Mill's work quite a bit today. She's um, she is the master of all things source citation and probably one of the queens of genealogy. And so she talks about the source as being the container in which the information resides. That's kind of an easy way to conceptualize this idea. The citation then is the actual information in the record. So the source, you're going to have a couple of options here. One is select a previous source. So if I've had a 1790 census before, or I can scroll through this list and see lots of census records in there, and some of those need to be cleaned up. If I've used Oregon death records, or Ohio marriage records, or whatever the case may be, if I've already used a record from a particular source, I can just come in here and pre-select that particular source, okay? If I've never used it before, I'm going to want to create a new source, and that's going to take me to a whole different screen. Now I'm going to just walk through these fields really quickly just so that you're aware of them, but the only field in this entire screen that is absolutely required is this top field, this title field. All the other fields are optional, and the reason they're optional is because not every single source is going to be exactly the same. So sometimes the source that, I am, that I'm creating, um, again, the container in which the information is held, is going to be a book. A book is a, a really obvious source, an actually printed book, um, whether it's a printed book that I tangibly held in my hands, or whether it's a book that I downloaded as a PDF off of one of the um, book link sites like Google Books or Genealogy Book Links. Uh, wherever, I, wherever I obtained a copy of that book, the book still has a title, and an author, and a publisher, and publisher location, and then it has a publishing date. Uh, usually it has a call number. I can make some notes that pertain to that particular source, an REFN number, and then a repository. We'll talk more about that repository in just a minute. So a book is probably the easiest, most obvious kind of source um, that you can create. Now there are other sources. So for example, a census is a source. And if you look through your existing source list, uh, based on the things you've attached in Ancestry, you'll get a feel for that. Um, maybe a source is a newspaper, or a source is um, a particular um, set of documents like Missouri State Death Certificates. There's a collection of those online. Okay, Again, whatever the case may be, um, you only have to have a title, but where you can fill in additional information, it's going to be useful. Now this is going to go back to one of the reasons why we create sources and source citations. One of them is so that we can find that information again. One of them is so that other people can find that information, can follow our research trail. And probably the most important reason why I create source citations is because in the process of creating them, what I'm doing is I'm analyzing this record. Where did this record come from? Who created it? Why was it created? When was it created? All of those are important to analyzing that record to understand how accurate the information contained in that record may be. So for example, if my source um, is a particular cemetery, right, a particular a tombstone, for example. 
knowing that 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 cemetery record that I'm looking at um, knowing that that tombstone was placed 60 years after the person died means that I'm going to give different weight to that particular piece of evidence than if it had been placed um, immediately upon death for example right so creating these source citations helps me to analyze the, the sources that I'm using so that I come to better conclusions about who's in my tree about the information and that all helps ensure that I'm climbing my own tree and not somebody else's that I haven't just attached some record that has nothing to do with my person so creating this source um, is is an important step now the repository here at the bottom of this source form is also important so this is where you're going to list I'm going to use a book as an example again because it's the easiest example um, uh, the repository for that book might be the library where you where you obtained it or it might be the website that digitized the books and you accessed that particular website you'll notice that I've got ancestry.com as the top repository here well that's because every record that I attach automatically through ancestry ancestry.com is listed as the repository you'll see I also have you know the family history library I try to get up there uh, up to Salt Lake City to the family history library a few times a year and they have ca you know cases full of microfilm uh, much of that microfilm that has not yet been digitized and put online and so if I access a particular reel of microfilm that has a book or a parish register or you know the the you know the little church in Germany the records for the little church in Germany where my family lived whatever the case may be that particular title or collection is going to be the source but the family history library is going to be the repository because that's where I obtained my copy of that record so it doesn't matter if the record is actually held by the National Archives um, if I obtain my copy through Ancestry or through the family history library Missouri State Archives through US Gen Web, whatever the case may be, I'm going to list the repository where I accessed that particular information. Now, once you've created your source, and, and um, that's a pretty simple process really, you're going to want to create the citation. Now the citation is about the specific information that you are using out of that particular record. And again, for me, one of the main purposes of this is that it helps me analyze the information as I'm entering this citation to ensure that I've got the right person, that I've extracted all the juicy goodness out of that record, that I understand the context of this record so that I understand how it fits with my other evidence. Um, one of the genealogical proof standard steps is resolving conflicting evidence. And if you've been doing this for any length of time, you know that you will often come across conflicting evidence. One person says the birth date was this, another, you know, another record says this, um, one record says they were born here, another record says here, so you have to be able to take all of that evidence about a person and you have to be able to resolve those conflicting pieces of evidence because a person really only died once in one place and they were only born once in one place and so having multiple you know um, alternate birth dates and places and death dates and places is silly right you need to be able to take all of that evidence and resolve it and come to a conclusion and your conclusion is going to be the best that you can come to at the time with the evidence that you have been able to to locate or to identify so the purpose of the source citation again is to help you just like the creating the source to help you analyze that information again much like the source the only thing that's required in this field is some kind of a title um, so in this case we're going to put the volume number or the film number or whatever additional detail is going to get us to that particular record we're going to enter a date here if that's significant we're going to enter the transcription of the text if you would like to now I actually I personally do this a little bit differently rather than putting the transcription of the text into my source citation I actually put it into my notes for the person and I do that so that I create a narrative and so that I have all my um, citation transcriptions in one location and I can quickly review them all together instead of having to open up individual citations but if this works for you absolutely do it that way 
You can include additional information, and here's um, where I include information like, um, you know, like if I'm reading a particular page of a census, and it's hard to read, and the names are really faded, and I've done the best I can in making out that information, I might make a note about how, you know, the bottom third of this page was burned, and so I might be missing some information, or the, the, the writing was really faint, and so it was kind of illegible, and I've done the best I can. I make whatever notations I can about the source or about that particular citation, just so that I understand what the limitations of those records are. And again, so that others who are looking at my source citations also know that I've taken the time to analyze that and that I'm admitting that, you know what, I might, I might be wrong. I might have misinterpreted this because of these particular limitations. If the source is something that you found online, so if it's something that you accessed, you know, for example, I mentioned the Missouri State Archives. They have a, a what's called the Missouri Digital Heritage website where they have digitized death certificates. I think they go from 1909 through 1961 or some such a thing. Uh, they've digitized the death certificates for the state and they've placed them on their state website. So they've given us the index to that on Ancestry. So I've attached that in that index where it has come up as a shaky leaf hint or I found it in a search. But then I go back and I actually obtain from this Missouri Digital Heritage website the actual copies of the certificate. And so I list that URL there. Now, some of you just might be wondering why I wanted to obtain an original copy of the certificate. There are a couple of quick reasons. One is because the person who made the transcription for the index uh, might have made a mistake. The other reason is because oftentimes, very often, there is more information on the original record than there is in the index. The purpose of an index is not to be a transcription of the record. The purpose of an index is to get you to the original, to let you know, you know, to help you find it, to help you know where you can go to access it. So the original record, in the case of these Missouri death certificates, actually lists parents' names and birthplaces. It lists a spouse's name if they were married. Um, it lists details about how they died. It might list where they're buried. So lots of additional information there. So you would enter here the URL of the website where you accessed those particular records if you accessed them online. Again, not all records are online. so. Um, you leave the fields blank that aren't pertinent to your particular citation. The last two steps in creating source citations, one is you're going to upload the media. So for example, again, these Missouri death certificates. If I have an actual um, image of that death certificate, here's where I'm going to upload that. I just click the yes button and it walks me through the steps to attach that particular piece of media. Now a lot of you have gotten in the habit of ta attaching your media to specific facts instead of creating source citations. And the new ancestry is, is um, a little uncomfortable for some of you because what we're doing is we're trying to move you into um, this more genealogical, genealogically accurate way of, of using your media. And I'm going to again use this death certificate as an example. A death certificate, if all you do is upload that, create a death fact and upload that death certificate to that death fact, you're missing out on some of those critical steps of the genealogical proof standard. Things like creating a full and accurate source citation. Um, but the other thing you're missing out on is the, is, is the idea that a death certificate is a source for more than just the death fact. And so what you'll see here is the final step of creating your source citation is that you'll see all of the facts that this particular event, uh, or all of the facts and events that this particular source citation uh, pertains to. So a death certificate, yes, it contains information about the death date and place. But it also is a piece of evidence for gender, and it's a piece of evidence for name, and it's a piece of evidence for birth date and place. It might be a piece of evidence for parents' names and birthplaces, for spouses' names and birthplaces, for the burial date and location, okay? So a death certificate is a source. It is not just an image. And that source pertains to a lot of facts, not just the obvious fact of a death certificate. 
And this is true of a lot of different things. So another type of record that I upload quite a bit is newspaper images, um, images of newspaper clippings, and maybe it's a, a statement about a, mar a pending marriage, or maybe it's a little blurb about somebody's parents coming to visit them um, and their new baby. And so now I've got this little news blurb that gives me the mother's maiden name, and it gives me the birth date of the baby and the name and the gender of the baby, right? So all of these little media items, for the most part, are sources as we are crafting um, these identities or re restoring these identities of these ancestors in our family tree. So that's how source citations work. Again, what's going to happen is once you've added that source citation, you're going to end up with sources from Ancestry and then sources that you've added from other locations. They're all going to be here in the center section. You can double click on any one of them um, and you can go in and edit any of those citation details and you can do this even on the source citations that Ancestry automatically creates for you. As a matter of fact, it's a useful exercise to go in and review some of the source citations that Ancestry has automatically created just to get a feel for the types of things that are put in some of the different fields. Here you'll see broken out the source information, the repository information, and the citation details. You'll also be able to see the associated facts and you can go through and remove or add any single fact from the information that's included or referenced by a particular citation. Hopefully that all made sense. Let me just end with a couple of best practices for source citations. Um, one is just a reminder that source citation is as much an art as it is a science. And so don't get too hung up in the mechanics of it. If it's overwhelming to you, just start doing it. Um, you'll, you may have noticed that in my source list, I have a lot of th things I need to clean up. And that's because I've been doing family history research since I was 12. Um, I started with PATH as my genealogy program. I moved to Family Tree Maker when I came to work here at Ancestry. Um, I've since 2012 with the ability of Family Tree Maker to sync with my online tree. Um, I keep those two things in sync. Until New Ancestry came out, I did most of my work in Family Tree Maker. Now that the New Ancestry has come out, I actually find so many of the things that um, I did in Family Tree Maker uh, are actually easier to do now in the New Ancestry experience. So I'm finding myself surprising to me spending a lot more time in my online tree than in Family Tree Maker. And so um, one of the things that I've been doing lately is actually going back through my tree, and it is not small, um, and redoing or revisiting some of those old source citations that I made when I was, you know, 12, 15, 18, 25, 35 years old. Um, I have learned more as I have um, grown in my genealogy experience and skill. And there are a lot of things in my tree that still need to be cleaned up. And I find that as I go back and revisit or redo some of those citations, I discover new evidence that I missed the first time around because I wasn't as meticulous in crafting those citations as I am now. So, so don't be too intimidated by it. Just jump in and get started and you'll find that you'll um, get better at it as, as time goes by. If you have questions about how to craft source citations, um, one of the things I would encourage you to do if you, if you can is to get a copy of the book Evidence Explained by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. She, like I said, she is um, the master of source citations, and that book covers everything. It covers how to cite a I think somebody once said it covers everything from how to cite a milk carton, um, so like actual artifacts and things in our possession, to anything that you might find in an archive or a library, to anything you might find online in any particular form or format. And so she walks through a lot of examples there. She also has a Facebook page for Evidence Explained where she shares tips almost daily. And I find it really useful to just kind of watch that on Facebook. And she has a website and her website has some great resources, some quick models that you can use if you can't get the book just yet um, so that you can you know, create those source citations or know how to cite certain sources.
And then just a reminder, and I can't stress this enough, um, any media that we attach that's not just a photograph, although photographs sometimes do fall into this category as well, just remember that those are sources that we are using to inform the research into our family history. And so make sure that you're creating those source citations for that media and uploading the, the media to your source citation as opposed to just uploading it to a specific fact. Um, I think it limits the usefulness of that particular piece of media if we are um, forcing it into just a singular fact. And I hope I've made that pretty clear. Okay, that is all I have prepared for you today. I hope this was useful and informative. Um, mostly my objective is just to get you to go click on things on the website and explore and see how they work for you. Um, and also it's to educate you about some proper genealogical practices and some standards in the industry and how Ancestry is working to try to conform to some of those standards and to help you to do the same. The October calendar for our October video events is already up on the Facebook page. Uh, so look at me getting it done a couple days before the end of the month. Um, so if you go to uh, Ancestry's Facebook page and click on the events tab, you'll be able to see all of the events scheduled for the month of October. Be sure to just click, I think Facebook changed the language. It used to say join. I think it now says going, um, but click that button. Uh, and whether you intend to attend intend to attend a live session of our video recordings or not, if you uh, RSVP on that Facebook uh, event, then when the video gets posted to YouTube, you'll get a Facebook notification that the video is now available on YouTube so that you can go and watch it at your convenience. And hopefully that made sense. <laughs> um, again, that's all I have for you today. So if you're watching this live, I will be on chat in just a few minutes. If you're watching this on YouTube, Feel free to leave a comment and I will respond to those as necessary. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.